Welcome to worship. Good morning. Huh? All right. You were, you were a little bit better than Saturday night, so um, yeah, welcome. I'm the, I'm the new assistant pastor here, Sean Baker, and it's an honor and a privilege to be with you and worship this morning, and we're really glad you're here. On your way in, you should have received a bulletin, and on the edge it has a perforated side, so write down your name. We, we want to know you're here worshiping with us, and then on the back, you can write down different prayer requests you have. So if you want the staff to pray for you or the, or the congregation to be in our prayers later in the service, let us know. And put that in the offering plate on your way out. One other thing to make your uh, attention aware of, our choir is going to sing for us today. And, and we're thankful for that. And, and choir rehearsal has started back up. So if you have the voice of music and you want to use your voice to serve Bethany here, choir practices start Wednesday at 6 o'clock, August 11th. And, and if you're interested, contact Kevin Kuski or our organist, uh, Heath Young. Those are all the announcements for this morning. And please rise as we continue to sing. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but we confess our sins. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteous. We take a moment for silence and self-reflection. Together, let's confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are unable to perform our duty. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and have failed to keep your commandments. Please forgive us and cleanse us from all In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. And to those who believe in Jesus' name, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and their praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Together we sing.
The Lord be with you. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power above all in showing mercy and pity. So mercifully grant us such a measure of your grace that we may obtain your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The scripture for today begins in the Old Testament, the first, chap first book of the Kings, the 19th chapter, reading from the first verse. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid, ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servants there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down underneath the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, he ate, and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And this is the word of the Lord.
all God's people said, Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with the 17th verse, the focus of our meditation today. Paul writes, So I tell you this, I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't let the devil have a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands so that he might have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may Benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And this is the word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father 
except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This, is, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we sing. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I begin, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Bethany, for all of your overwhelming support for Molly and I as we've transitioned into this new church home. Thank you for the many cards and gifts. Thank you for the prayers that you've said on our behalf and the prayers that you continue to say on our behalf. As Molly and I join this new church home, as we begin to serve our Lord here at Bethany in the church and the school. Thank you, Bethany. Because times of transition, they can be tough. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to say goodbye to the old and you have to embrace the new. And moving, is, is definitely a time of transition. When, when you move, you have to say goodbye to the, the favorite restaurants that you've come to know. You, you have to say goodbye to the familiar streets and, and, and faces that you've come to recognize. When you move, you have to say goodbye to that loving neighbor that you formed a relationship with. 
And, and when you move, you have to say goodbye to that old house, despite all of its quirks and imperfections. And, and when you move, you have to decide, is, is this stuff going to stay with us, or is this stuff going to be thrown away or left behind? And, and Molly and I, we just did this a few weeks ago. I remember we were packing up our house in St. Louis, the, the moving boxes were sprawled out all across the living room, and we found stacks of papers as we were moving up, and we said, well, well, these papers are old and useless, so we don't need to pack these up, so, so we threw those away. And, and then I remember as we were cleaning up our upstairs office, packing up the house, we, we, we found things tucked away in the junk drawer, and, and, and we said, well, 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 these things were useful at one time, but, but they're not going to be useful in our new home in Kansas City. So, so we decided to throw those away as well. And I remember for myself, going through all the books that I've accumulated throughout my time at seminary. You, you know, at seminary, you read a lot of books, right? And, and you know, those, those big, heavy books, those books that you needed for that one class, for that one reading, for that one homework assignment? Well, well, well I knew that those big, heavy books, they weren't going to make it with me on the moving truck to, to Kansas City. Times of transition, they can be tough, but they also cause you to analyze, to go through, to determine, do I need this thing or, or, or do I not? They, they give you the opportunity to throw out, to purge, to, to get rid of the old, useless stuff that you no longer need anymore. Well, there, there are some people who really have a hard time getting rid of their old, useless stuff. For, for whatever reason, they can't convince themselves to, to clean out, to purge. Now, maybe some of these people, maybe they don't like transition. Maybe they don't like change. Or, or, or maybe some people, the reason they don't get rid of their old, useless stuff is because they think, Someone is going to want this useless stuff. So, this stuff is going to be valuable for somebody. This stuff is a treasure, right? And, and maybe some of you have picked up some treasures as you went to the, the, the school garage sale this weekend. Or maybe another reason some people like to keep on to their old useless stuff is because having all their stuff next to them, knowing where everything is at, that's a comfortable lifestyle for them. They, they like to keep all of their old stuff. And in fact, there's a, there's a TV show that documents people and their old stuff, and it's called Hoarders. And these are people who really struggle getting rid of old things, but, but in an extreme way. And maybe some of you have seen it, right? It, it documents people and all their stuff. They go from home to home with camera crew, and as, as you see some of these homes that they live in, it, it truly is amazing. There are some homes where you have boxes piled from floor to ceiling, filled with stuff. There are other homes where you, you can't tell what color the paint is on the wall because you can't see the wall. There are other homes where, where you can't tell where one room ends and the other room begins. And then there are some homes where you can't tell what surface the floor is made of because you can't see the floor. There are some people in this world, and maybe you're one of them, who, who really struggle with getting rid of their old stuff. For whatever reason, they can't convince themselves to purge, to clean out. Well, in our text today, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, he, he's writing to the church of Ephesus. But, but what he says to the church of Ephesus applies to you and me today here at Bethany Lutheran Church in Overland Park. Kansas. Paul, in, in verse 22, he says to the church of Ephesus to put off the old, to remove the old way of life, the way of life before you knew Jesus, and to put on the new. Put on the new self that Christ has given you. So the question is, how do you and I, how do we remove the old self and put on the new self? that Christ has given us? Well, this is a really difficult thing to do. And in fact, it's an impossible thing to do if, if we rely on our own strength and our own ability. You see, whether we like to admit it or not, 
you and I are, are more like spiritual hoarders than clean, pristine people of God. Sure, from time to time, we love to wear the new self that Christ has given us, but, but we sure like to keep the old self close. We, we like to keep it right where it's at, where nobody else can see it. We like to keep it tucked away in the spiritual closets of our lives. It's like that one person who keeps their old clothes in the back of their closet. Even though their old clothes, they don't fit them anymore, they, they've outgrown their old clothes, and maybe the reason they keep their old clothes is because they like the style of them. Or maybe some people keep their old clothes tucked away in the back of the closet because they like the memories that they made in their old clothes. Or, or, or maybe some people, they keep their clothes tucked away in the back of the closet because one day they know that they're going to work out enough. They're going to get strong enough. And one day that they're going to fit back into those old, comfortable, stylish clothes. Well, that's some of us this morning in our spiritual lives. We remove the old self from us, but, but we sure like to keep it tucked away in the corner where nobody else can see it. That's some of us. And then, and then there's others of us today. We, we hear the words of Paul, and we really want to do what it says. We want to remove the old self completely, and we want to wear the new self that Christ has has given us. So we begin to clean, we begin to purge, we, we go to those back corners of our spiritual closets and we begin to clean out. And, and we try hard to clean and clean and clean. But as we try hard to clean and clean and clean, we realize that we can't clean it all. We, we can't get rid of it all. So we start to get discouraged because as we clean one corner of our spiritual closet, we find in the other corner an unending pile of our old selfness, our, our, our sinfulness piled from floor to ceiling, and, and we can't get rid of it all. We start to become discouraged because we know that we can't clean ourselves. We can't cl get rid of it all. So how do we remove the old self and put on the new self that Christ has given us? Well, one answer is really good news for us, that we that we have a God who doesn't leave us alone to clean up our spiritual hoarding by ourselves. We have a God who doesn't just look down upon us and say, wow, these people are messy, they're hoarders, they're dirty. But instead, we have a God who comes to remove your old self from you. We have a God who, who sends his son, Jesus, to find you in the midst of your spiritual mess. Maybe some of you this morning feel like a spiritual hoarder. Everywhere you look in your life, you're reminded of your sinful past. You're reminded of your brokenness. Well, Jesus has come to find you in the midst of your mess. He has come to clean your mess. Or maybe others of us this morning. We, we try hard and hard to clean our spiritual lives up, but we begin to get discouraged because we know that we can't do it alone. We have a God who sent his son Jesus to clean your whole spiritual house. He cleans you completely. We have a God who sends Jesus to get his hands dirty in your old selfness. And Jesus Christ, to clean you, he put on something new to him. He put on your old self. He put on humanity he put on death. He put on that purple robe and that crown of thorns for you, removing your old self from you completely so that you could be made new. And because Jesus Christ, because he went to that cross, because he rose from the grave, you have been made new in him. Your, your old self is gone from you. You have been cleaned in Christ. You were made new in him. And maybe some of you this morning are hearing this and you're saying, wow, that's great, Pastor Sean, that, that Christ has given me this new self, but, but I still screw up. I still make mistakes. I, I still don't live according to the new self that Christ has given me. So how do I put off the old and put on the new? How do I do that? Well, that's, that's where the promise that Christ has given you of forgiveness 
comes in. That's the, where the promise that you are made a child of God, a clean child of God in your baptism, that's where that comes in. And, and just because we see, we've received these new selves from Christ doesn't mean that we're independent Christ followers off to do our own thing. No. Christ is the source of your newness. He, he's the source of your righteousness. He's the source of your holiness. And, and at your baptism, he gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit to keep you connected to the source, to keep you connected to him. At your baptism, he gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to empower you, to boldly wear the new self, the new clothes that Christ has given you. So what does that look like? What is boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given us? What does that look like? Well, Paul, he tells us later on in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul, he says, stop wearing falsehood. Stop saying falsehood to your neighbor and live truthfully with them. In other words, when you're talking about other people, don't gossip about them. Don't create lies about them. But bear true testimony to your neighbor. That's boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given you. And, and Paul, he goes on, he says, do not let your anger lead you to sin. In other words, deal with people in love. That's boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given you. He says again, don't steal or let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. In other words, deal with people with honesty, integrity. That's boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given you. And, and Paul, he sums it up at the end of our reading in, in chapter 5, verse 2. He says, live a life of love just as Christ has loved us. That's boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given you. Sharing the love of Jesus in, with your words and with your actions, that's boldly wearing the new self that Christ has given you. My friends at Bethany, I encourage you today to live a life of love. And that could look different for everybody here in this room. It could look like cleaning the house, doing the dishes, even if you're the one who didn't make the mess. It, it could look like giving up your time with the television so somebody else could watch something that they want to watch. It, it could look like making dinner for your spouse, even if that isn't your skill or your talent. Those are all ways that we can boldly wear the new self that Christ has given us. My friends at Bethany, you've been made new in Christ. As long as we're connected to Christ, the source of our righteousness, you are made new. Your old is gone, and you are made new in him. Now may the grace of God, the God who has made us new, may he guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we, we have the opportunity to confess our Christian faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed, so I invite you to rise. And we join together. I believe in God. Now have a time of prayer. Gracious and merciful Lord, we give you thanks for gifting us with the Holy Spirit, bathing us in the blood of the Lamb, adopting us into your family, 
writing our names in the book of life, and declaring us heirs according to promise, all through the waters of baptism. For a portion of our congregation today, we celebrate with them their baptismal birthdays. And remember that moment when you chose them as your own, a peculiar people. We pray for Andrea and Shannon, for Kendall and Diane, for Bethany, Michaela, for Sarah and Ian, for Jonah. And we pray, Lord, that in the midst of this month of celebration, they might pause, and every time they touch water, be reminded of the water that touched the very fibers of their soul and claim them as your own. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for the spear breakers, and particularly for Nate, who today is being installed and ordained a pastor. Bless this day for him and for those who gather around him. Empower him, Lord, to lift high the cross of Christ. May speak with purity your word and proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, who all have ears to hear and hearts to believe and tongues willing to confess that. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who are celebrating anniversaries for KC and for Chanel, for the Stomakowitzes. We pray, Lord, that you be with Carrie and with Carla as well, and that you would bless them this celebration in the love, the greater love that you express to them through Jesus Christ. And may their love be an expression of your greater love to the world around them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for the youth, for the families that have begun to gather and prepare to begin their catechetical instruction this fall. We pray that their hearts might be opened, that their ears might be attentive, and their voices eager to confess the faith in which they were baptized and to grow in discipleship from glory to glory until ultimately you complete the good work you've begun in each of their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for our staffs at the preschool, the Mother's Day Out, the elementary and the high school as they gear up for the start of the school year and as they begin to make changes in light of the whole COVID uh, experience that we're having now. Help them, Lord, do that which is good and please in your sight, protecting the littlest of the little ones around us, guarding their hearts and their lives, and leading them always toward Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we thank you for the birth of Emmett. We have long prayed for him and his family. We thank you for his arrival. We thank you for the safety of mom and child. And as they grow and as they develop those relationships one between the other, Lord, bring him into your presence and mark the start of a relationship with him through the waters of baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we grieve, but not like the world grieves. We grieve as a people who know the rest of the story who claim the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. Be with the family of Cindy as they mourn her loss. Give them a peace that only you can give, a peace that passes all human understanding that will guard their hearts and minds in faith until life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with their health, for those who are in our hospitals, in hospice care, at home, under doctor's supervision, for those struggling emotionally and physically. We pray for Brian and Marianne, and Jean and Pekka, Brad and Heather, and the many others, Lord, that we know of, friends and relatives, neighbors, associates, fellow students that are challenged and struggling with their health and with their relationship and with the brokenness that is so much a part of the life we live. Touch their hearts, creating them new spirits and right hearts. And if it's your will to also repair the damage done to them physically or emotionally, to you be all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. and to your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. 
trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We continue now by receiving our gifts to the Lord, and as we do, we'll celebrate the offertory. All God's people said, Amen. please rise. Father, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. It is in your nature to give. And we celebrate today the gift of grace, the gift of life, the gift of this season, the wonders that surround us and the gift of the gathering of your people in this place. How can we not respond by giving in return? Accept our gifts. May they be pleasing in your sight. May they give you all glory and honor and praise and build your kingdom here on earth as it already is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. together we sing.
And Father, we pray as we've been taught. Our Father. There are many blessings in the Bible. One stands out among them all. This one has a promise. And the promise is when spoken, God puts his name on our hearts. Receive now the name that is above every other name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his countenance, his favor, and give to you his peace. Thank you.